After the last VIG-20 repair video, lots of questions came up. Is the ROM dead? What about that adapter? Is it spelled that way? So let's answer them today. Hello and welcome back to Noel's Retro Lab. A couple of videos ago, I repaired a VIG-20 with a faulty kernel ROM. I got some really good questions and suggestions in response to that video, so I'm going to address some of those today. Some of you asked if I had tried reading the ROM by some other means, because it could be that the ROM was fine and the problem was the single wipe socket instead. To be fair, those MOS ROMs tend to fail a lot, but it was definitely a valid question, and no, I had not tried reading it back. But I figured today is a perfect time to give it a try and see if we can read this. So I took out my regular EEPROM programmer, and it turns out that the equivalent EEPROM for this is a 2364. So I went to look at it in the supported EEPROMs and it wasn't there, which I mean, in a way is not too surprising because the 2364 requires higher voltages than this can provides. But I would have expected this to be able to read it back because you can read it back without any weird voltages at all. So that was kind of surprising. Or maybe there's a way to do this and I don't know about it. So. But that's okay, because I have another tool in my workbench that is able to read a 2364, and that is the 8-bit Museum Retrochip Tester. So before we test this, actually what I'd like to do is try it with a working kernel ROM. And so for that I have my working VIG-20. So we'll just take the kernel ROM and we'll test that one. The reason I want to test that is because this tester will recognize certain ROMs. And if so, it will just tell us it's a VIG-20 kernel ROM. And that way I don't have to download the image and then do a diff on the computer and all of that. So that should be a lot nicer if it detects it. Okay, I think that's the correct one, 2364. Well, let's try it. Commodore, yes. Okay, perfect. VIG-20, kernel, revision 7. That is excellent. So, let's just tell it to, yes, let's do it again. Let's make sure I put it the correct way up. And let's see. Okay, so this is very interesting. It read something, so it, it wasn't totally dead, but the CRC it got back didn't match anything in its database, and it clearly knew not just about the VIG-20 kernel and ROM, but different revisions, enough, enough to know that this was revision 7. So I'm going to say without going any further that yes, this ROM is just not good at all. But since I like knowing exactly what's going on, let's actually download the data. Um, that way we'll see, is it just a byte that is off or is it just completely wrong? It'd be interesting to find out. So uh, let's hold it. Okay, now it's saving it. There we go. It created it on the SD card and let's have a look at that data now. So let's open up the data that we just read from the ROM. And yeah, that looks like total garbage. <laughs> That's a very clear, there are just some bit patterns repeated and yeah, just, all right. It's, it's not just that it's missing a byte or two, which makes sense because if it was just a byte or two, if you remember, we only needed a few bytes to be correct in this ROM for us to be able to launch into the cartridge diagnostics ROM. We pretty much needed the address of the routine and then a very short routine that looks for some bytes. So yeah, this is, this is pretty much what I expected. The ROM is totally gone. The other comment that I got quite a bit is about the socket and the pins I used for the adapter. Does the adapter to use a larger EEPROM in place of the VIG-20 ROM? For that, we use a custom PCB from an open source project, and I have a link in the description, and had them built at, where else, PCBWay, which by the way is this episode's sponsor. It really couldn't have been easier to order those adapters. From the project page, click on order on PCBWay, add them to the cart, and you're done. And those adapter PCBs come in really handy for all sorts of smaller ROMs, not just VIG-20s or Commodore 64s. As a matter of fact, I used them in the past for a Coco 2 ROM. 
So the problem is that the pins I used, let's see how I can get this out. I may need to use this. There we go. So the pins I used are those square normal pin headers, and they're not really intended to be used in this kind of socket, especially this old style socket. It has a single wipe, so it makes it doesn't make as good contact as a double wipe socket. And there isn't anything really horribly wrong. I mean, it will work the way I did it. What's gonna, or what's already happened is that I've stretched the wipes in there. So if now at some point somebody comes along with maybe an original ROM and they wanna put it there, it's probably not going to make correct contact. So let's see, you know, it goes in pretty easily. So maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but it, it's really not ideal because those pins have pushed the wipes away and Again, because they're, they're single wipe, it makes it much more likely that now we're not gonna make correct contact. So that was not ideal. Ideally, I should have used what they call turned pins, which are round, um, just the, round, the, the pins themselves are round. So they will go in in those kind of sockets without deforming them as much. But an even better thing is that there really, there is no point in having a socket, the adapter with a socket itself, and then the EEPROM. If I'm ever going to put a new EEPROM, I'll just take this one out and put another one in. So let's do this correctly. Let's remove the socket and solder this directly on the board. And by doing this, there won't be any potential problems in the future. So I think that's a much better solution. Normally I recommend never soldering something, never soldering a socket with a chip inserted because the legs of the chip could have some solder and then as you heat up the socket from the other side, it may melt that solder and then the chip will get soldered into the socket itself. But in this case, it doesn't matter because the legs that we're soldering are not touching this one. So we're, we're doing the legs of the adapter and then there's a, a socket on top. So. We're fine doing that. There you go, that's perfect. It's not as tall, which is always good. And if we need to replace it, we can remove it from here and put a new EEPROM. And that's much, much better. Really, I should have done it this way from the very beginning. So thanks to everybody who pointed it out and suggested this approach. The last thing I wanna talk about is why I labeled it kernel spelled that way. A lot of you pointed out that kernel is not spelled that way in English. And yes, I'm aware of that. The OS ROM is often called the kernel ROM in a lot of computers, and it contains a lot of functions to interface with the hardware. And in most cases, it's really spelled kernel with an E. I wrote a kernel with an A because that's the way Commodore spelled it in their own documentation. The story goes that this spelling was originally due to a typo by one of the Commodore engineers in the VIC-20 project, and then it was later picked up by the manual writers. You can see it in the VIC-20 programmer's reference guide. There's a whole chapter talking about the kernel with A, all in capital letters too, explaining what it was and what it was used for. Commodore had plenty of chances to fix it with new revisions of the manual and even new computers like the Commodore 64, yet they chose to stick with the original spelling. The Commodore 64 Programmer's Reference Guide has a similar chapter talking about the kernel, so at this point it was very clear they were doing this very much on purpose. It even goes beyond the official Commodore books. Grab any programming book from around that time and you'll see that they also refer to it as the kernel ROM spelled the same way. I'm not sure what the reasons were for staying with that spelling. It could be that they like having a proprietary name that could be trademarked someday, or maybe they just wanted to be consistent. In any case, they stuck to it, so I figured I should do the same thing when I'm using those terms. Otherwise, it would be like calling the Amstrad CPC gate array the ULA, <laughs> which is technically correct, but it's not something you see in the Amstrad documentation. So my recommendation is that if you're dealing with a VIC-20 or a Commodore 64, call it the kernel with an A. And that's it for this short follow-up about the ROM. 
Thanks to all of you who brought up these very good points. I actually really enjoy when comments and questions feed back into new videos and we can have two-way conversations beyond just YouTube comments or Discord conversations. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this episode. As usual, feel free to leave any comments and I will see you next time. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting Noel's Retro Lab on Patreon or joining the membership on YouTube. Not only is that the best way to support this channel and allow me to continue making more videos, but you also get some extra perks like early access, ad-free videos, and more. Thank you again to all the supporters. See you next time.